Frank, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to have some procedural questions when we get the Q&A, uh, but now this is, this is the uh, part of the program that I think is very interesting to me. As Stephen mentioned, which I find rather remarkable, is that in 1972 there was a committee that understood that there were risks of sea level rise and they understood concepts of global warming, and now um, I, I'd be hard-pressed to think that there are people in this room, given what we've been through in this community, who don't believe that that is a very real issue. Um, I'd like to give you a little bit of a background about Adam Welchel. He's got a fascinating background, I must say. Uh, Adam is the Director of Conservation Programs at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, he is located in New Haven, Connecticut. Adam has earned degrees in wildlife and fisheries ecology at the University of Vermont, um, his master's in ecology at San Francisco State, uh, and wetland science at the University of Delaware for his PhD. Among Adam's many, many publications is a 2010 report on adapting to climate change involving building interactive decision support to manage coastal conservation and mitigate hazards. Um, tonight, Adam will address the impacts of projected weather patterns and sea level rise on waterfronts and waterfront communities such as ours. We will get a look at computerized projections of weather and sea level rise for the Westchester shoreline communities fronting on the Long Island Sound. In keeping with the topic of updating the Marinex Waterfront Program, Adam will discuss methods for long-term sustainable coastal development to assist us in planning successfully for the future. Please welcome Adam Welchel. Great, thank you very much, Beth. Well, I grew up in uh, the hills of Connecticut, and once a year, swimming and running through forests and doing all kinds of crazy stuff as a kid, once a year, we'd go down to Long Island Sound, and my folks tried to convince me that it was actually the ocean or an estuary. I didn't know what an estuary was, but I could see the other side, and in my mind, it was nothing but the largest river in the world. And I love that. I love that idea that uh, you can hang on to the wonders and the magic of, of what you see as a, as a child. And I've had the, uh, the benefit of uh, bringing my kids down to Long Island Sound and uh, having them experience the, the wonders and the magic of the estuary of my childhood. Now, it, it stuck with me, and I've done a lot of work in a lot of different places, but it's always involving estuaries. Uh, one thing that, uh, that I've noticed in a lot of estuaries uh, that I've worked in, and I see it particularly now when I bring my kids back to the same places that I remember as a kid, is that there seems like there's a lot more people around. There's just a lot more going on. There's a lot more stuff happening. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's been getting me thinking about uh, my career has been very much focused on the ecological resources of a place like... Uh, uh, Long Island Sound and, and thinking about how do we get away from this idea of us as environmentalists uh, thinking about only the natural resources or only the, the, the critical sparrow species or uh, the, the very, very important turtle species and how do, how do we start thinking about uh, working with and for people and this idea of people and nature and thinking about how nature's benefits can advantage us those of us that live along the shore, and can provide us with solutions uh, to some of the issues that are uh, ever growing along our coast. So in my work with the Nature Conservancy, we started thinking hard about this back in 2007, and we were getting frustrated. We, we recognized that uh, this climate change thing was out there, and we were wanted to know more about what are the impacts going to be from changes in sea level. Not only that, we wanted to know more about what are the changes going to be from storm surge and increased frequency and duration and intensity of different storms. Because we had made a significant investment as a community and as an organization in a lot of critical natural resources around Long Island Sound and, and up and down the, the coast of New York. So we, we were frustrated. We wanted to know what, what were the projections here so that we could get a handle on what, what's going to happen in the future. And so we started going about that and we quickly realized that Hey, it's not just about resources, it's about people. And uh, because there are a lot of people that live along the coast. And so we started thinking about how do we create something that will be both compelling, science-based, 
And something that people can plan with, envision the future and visualize the future and plan about towards the future. So we set about creating this thing called Coast Resilience, which is a web-based tool uh, that's effectively a decision support tool for people that need to make decisions in local municipalities around the entire circumference of Long Island Sound. At the core of this program is this idea looking at coastal climate adaptation, uh, thinking about ways that we can prepare and protect ecosystems and reduce the severity of shoreline change to coastal communities. We think a lot about this idea of what are the benefits of salt marshes, uh, the, the protective capacity or the defense or the, the filtration or the wave attenuation, anything you wanna say, things that protect our coastline that are already there oftentimes providing these services and benefits for free. Now, given all of this, this idea of trying to protect the ecosystem and the multi-objective kind of planning approaches that Steve had mentioned, I think it's a very natural fit for something like uh, uh, the, the, the um, LWRPs and the, not only the plan, but also the program. And looking at, you know, the definition of these things. You know, the multi-objectives, we're talking about nature, we're talking about the public. We're talking about working waterfronts in developed areas. And where do we find that balance as we look forward on things like sea level rise and storm surge? And again, I think one of the, the really critical pieces of this, and we see it all the time as we go around and interview and spend time with communities in Long Island Sound, is you have these different levels of government. Uh, you have the federal government, you have the state governments. You guys have counties in New York and Connecticut. We don't have county structures, so maybe that's, maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing, I don't know. Uh, but we have regional planning authorities and we have towns and we have villages, we have boroughs. I got the, the impression that this is a very complicated piece of, uh, of, of, the, of Long Island Sound with all kinds of uh, overlays and, and interesting uh, intermixing of, of different local governance structures. But this is really at the heart of what, what we're trying to do, provide information in a science-based uh, way uh, that can help local communities plan for the future. Our program is broken up into four different steps. Uh, the first being awareness of the information that's out there. This idea of helping towns and communities think about what's at risk and how they're vulnerable. Uh, defining choices and developing uh, kind of solutions that could be implemented, and then of course taking action. Uh, and again, it's, it's both a website and a tool. It's chock full of information uh, specifically designed for, for this intended purpose. So the hypothesis behind this whole approach here is that if we can compile and generate uh, information in a comprehensive way, that the folks who need to make those hard decisions about people's livelihoods and, and natural resources and, and uh, uh, property values and things of that nature, with, armed with this information, they can make uh, better information not only for the ecological aspects, elements of our coast, but also the social and the economic aspects of the coast. So the key underlining word here is resilience how can we prepare ourselves for the kind of changes that are likely in the future uh, so that we continue to have vibrant, sustainable communities along the shores of Long Island Sound. You can go to the website, coastresilience.org. Uh, there's a number of different geographies that are hosted here, including Long Island Sound. You can link directly to that. I'll mention that there's quite a bit of information in here. There's actually a page called What Can Be Done, and I'll highlight that on the, on the way out of this talk. But the one piece that, that's embedded in here is an, a visualization tool called the, the, the Future Scenario Map. Here's the footprint of our current tool. As you can see, it includes Westchester County, uh, the Long Island uh, Sound watershed portions of the five boroughs, Nassau, Suffolk County, and the entire coast of uh, Connecticut. There are some critical partners in here that I need to mention quickly. Uh, NOAA Coastal Service Center uh, has been the brains behind the, 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 the hurricane storm surge information that's built into the tool. We've got the downscaled sea level rise data uh, coming out of Columbia University, NASA, Goddard Institute of Space Studies, the various information that uh, Plan NYC is using. So it's not the off-the-shelf sea level rise projections. This has actually been downscaled 
or locally applied to this specific part of the world. So this is the, the best available uh, scientifically derived information coming from a highly credible source. The what can be done section of the tool that I mentioned uh, was uh, compiled by Pace Law University Law School right here in, in, this, in this neck of the woods. Great people, very smart attorneys and land use policy folks that have compiled a lot of information that's built in here. And then we also have a partnership with the Association of State Floodplain Managers, which is an interesting approach. Um, they are very much in tune with some of the analysis that FEMA requires folks to use uh, as you begin to assess what the replacement value or the replacement cost would be of structures that are impacted by either sea level rise or storm surge. So a good suite of folks uh, all built into this, this package called the Coast Resilience Tool. At the very, the beating heart of this thing is, as I mentioned, the sea level rise data as well as the storm surge data. Uh, it's designed to provide some choices. There's a lot of ways to think about this. There's a lot of scenarios out there, but what we wanted to provide was both conservative estimates as well as more progressive estimates. Uh, you know, and so we've got three different time steps here, 2020, 2050, 2080. And we've got three different sea level rise scenarios, high being perhaps outside your, your comfort zone in terms of projections of what sea level rise will be over those three steps. Medium and then conservative. And then of course you can look at not only sea level rise projections, but you can also look and or storm surge. So you can combine the two. This is a, a mastic beach on the south shore of, of Long Island. Um, pretty shocking, pretty overwhelming. Um, we tend not to show maps of, uh, when we do presentations like this, we tend not to show maps of your specific community. We like to show other people, whether that's good or bad. Um, but you can look through time here. This is really the beating heart of it. Um, just giving you a sense. One of the things that the, the town planners really wanted to see was the ability to look at one scenario on the left-hand side and one scenario on the right-hand side. So you could compare scenarios and generate maps that could be instructive for uh, awareness and information uh, provision. It's chock full of information, ecological, social, economic, uh, critical facilities such as uh, uh, police stations, schools, etc. And it's got a lot of land use, uh, land use, land land cover information, as well as uh, some of the the new DFERM maps from uh, FEMA. Uh, it's got things like social vulnerability indexes, looking at what the dem demographics are for various communities. Where is your population over 65? Uh, where is your population under five? Uh, where are the renters versus owners? Uh, a bunch of critical information that really is important when you start planning for uh, the kind of changes that uh, will, will happen in a particular community. Quite a bit of information, uh, again, using HAZIS, um, which is a standard uh, FEMA approach for uh, calculating replacement value uh, of, of losses associated with storms. Uh, we've got information in here that uh, will give you a sense of what percentage of loss could be expected from various scenarios in, in the population census blocks. Again, I mentioned the critical facilities, uh, the new uh, FEMA uh, digital uh, firm maps are, are built into this. This is really a, a critical uh, layer to have, obviously, because there's a lot of federal uh, uh, regulations built into this particular layer, as you all know. Um, so great, so you build this thing. You're showing me, you know, what's going to happen in the future. How does that help me? Well, beyond the what can be done section, we've really put a lot of time and energy into thinking about the kind of scenarios and, and uh, combining the information in such a way that it, that it helps uh, think through some potential choices. Uh, of course, being the Nature Conservancy, we're very interested in natural resources protection, but also blending that with how can these resources help us? Uh, have a more resilient uh, community, thinking about nature's benefits. Of course, emergency managers are all over this. They're all about it, thinking about egress routes and uh, which communities will be impacted because they haven't been, have, had the, the, the ability to see it visually laid out on a particular map. 
And I think the one that I think is uh, probably most appropriate for this evening is thinking about uh, planning and development and, and future growth strategies, uh, whether it's along the, the shoreline or it's the entire community coming back from the shoreline. And thinking about how uh, the risks associated with this kind of information can be built into such things as uh, the, the local watershed revitalization program and just really being aware of it. it. It's at this stage, I think, is just information and awareness, whether it's acted upon as another issue that often is outside the realm of, of uh, whatever information is provided. But it's, we're hoping that people will spend some time with us and uh, you know, get a sense as to uh, what's, what, what potentially could happen. And all the methods and the metadata, as the GIS folks likes to call it, are all built in there so you can understand where it's coming from. So now let's take a look at, uh, I'm breaking my cardinal rule here, and I'm gonna show you some, some shots from your community. So one of the great things uh, that I heard this evening is the fact that there are multiple towns uh, working together collectively to think about a collective approach to planning forward for the community. Too often, and, uh, and this is, uh, drives me crazy, uh, towns think about themselves because they, that's their mandate, that's what their, uh, the elected officials, officials are uh, responsible for. But there's a great opportunity here, I think, to think a little bit more regionally and link up, uh, particularly with this issue, because when you think about the likely scenarios and the potential solutions, we're all in the same boat. And if we can think about this together and combine expertise and uh, uh, whatever it might be to make this thing go. So you can look at multiple towns. Uh, this is a 2080 high sea level rise scenario for uh, your neck of the woods here. You can go right into a single town and begin to look at what the uh, uh, potential uh, projections are showing. Again, these are not predictions, these are projections. I think that's a critical uh, element to be carrying around with you. Too often, I think we, we grab onto maps uh, and visuals and say, that's it, that's a prediction. These are projections, right? And, and what we know about climate science, and I'm not a climate scientist, uh, but I never go anywhere without one, or I try not to, um, is that uh, this science is evolving, and we need to be looking at this on a three to five year basis. So this is the best available information. This is uh, uh, vintage 2010, so um, we will be redoing this over time, but uh, this is what it is today. I'm trying to get you not to look at this, but. Uh, and then you can zone right into a specific harbor, in this case, uh, uh, the emphasis and focus of, of your local planning here. This is a category three hurricane. You'll notice that there are some deep blue, a color ramp here. The deep blue is where we have the highest confidence that these areas will be flooded under this type of scenario. As you move out into the, the, the other colors, it becomes, we, we're, we're less confident about, uh, about that. Again, we're trying to build science in here and be responsible purveyors of information. Uh, and, uh, um, Again, there's further methodologies uh, listed in the report. As I mentioned, this is uh, using the HAZUS level one analysis for FEMA. You can begin to look at what percentage of building loss will occur in various population blocks in your particular community. For example, in this part of the, the coastline here, you're looking at anywhere from a 21 uh, to 40% loss with a category three hurricane. Again, it's not exact but it is important information uh, that uh, I would think would need to be at least considered. Again, the what can be done section. There's actually a section in here, a lot of my colleagues work in Long Island, uh, and we've populated this with uh, information regarding uh, shoreline management plans as well as uh, local waterfront revitalization plans and post-storm redevelopment programs. I think it's, that's a critical element that we don't often think about, and I would hope that as you go through a comprehensive planning process and thinking about consistency and, and uh, uh, you know, multiple objectives, there would be some attention placed on what do you do after a storm, a big storm, and how does that factor into your long-range planning for a particular community? That's a critical ingredient that I think uh, uh, we don't think enough about, uh, and uh, oftentimes it, prevent, it provides opportunities as well as challenges uh, but I think there's an emphasis on the opportunities that, that should not be overlooked. 
again, as we walk around and, and spend time with folks, uh, one of the big challenges we have, uh, no secret, we have uh, mixed understanding and acceptance of what this thing is out there. I, I've gotten to the point now where I, I don't uh, always say coastal climate change. I think uh, the important point is it's coastal change. The coast has changed, it will change, and it's gonna change in the future. One of the critical pieces is that uh, a lot of communities will have comprehensive plans, they'll have, and then they'll have separate plans. In Connecticut, they have uh, natural hazard mitigation plans, which they don't sync up or talk to one another. So you end up with a bunch of plans. Uh, and then I think uh, one of the things where we often fall short is, so we come up with wonderful choices that obviously are, are hard decisions in a lot of cases. But to have that economic, the cost benefit analysis of, of what these alternatives are gonna cost the town in terms of capital improvements, or um, uh, uh, you know, thinking about what, what are the cost benefit analysis. So we're, we're spending a lot of time thinking about that and, and uh, what, 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 are the, what are the long-term and short-term costs of making the, the uh, different, adopting different or putting into action different alternatives. Uh, and what are the cost saving features, for instance, of uh, retaining uh, salt marshes and thinking about how they could actually, uh, how does that translate into dollars and cents as you're trying to uh, rectify or, or uh, uh, balance your budget on an annual basis? Next steps for us is working directly with communities, thinking about risk, choices, and action. Uh, we're gonna be working very hard with honest to goodness economists uh, to develop cost-benefit comparisons of, uh, of likely scenarios that could be leveraged and, and, and useful uh, at any scale. You know, integrating this kind of information into various planning processes and, and various documents. It's out there, it's for you to use uh, if you so choose. Uh, and then most importantly, uh, when you think and, and talk with folks like NOAA Coastal Service Center, for example, who's a federal agency whose job it is whose mandate it is, is to service the nation's coast, all four coasts, including the Great Lakes. And when you sit down and talk with them and you, you ask them, okay, can, can you give me a handful of examples of communities around the nation that have actually created some resilience or, or done something that has actually uh, enabled them to accommodate uh, different changes in sea level rise or storm surge? And it's, there aren't many, you know? So there, there is a real need here to uh, learn uh, from various local processes and get that information out uh, so that others can benefit from uh, lessons learned, not only here in New York, but also nationally and perhaps even internationally. Um, so again, coastresilience.org, click on geography, find your way to Long Island Sound and uh, take a look. We're gonna open this up for questions in, in a minute. Uh, I wanted to mention that uh, the, of the 44 elements, I noticed that energy was one of them. Um, I personally have been very involved in the Marcella Shell issue for the, the uh, State League. We just met with Tom Congdon on Friday, who is Governor Cuomo's energy advisor, and uh, Robert Rosenthal, who's newly appointed as his counsel, discussing both what's um, going on with respect to the drilling in upstate New York, which is of great concern to the League of Women Voters. I know it's, a, it's of obvious concern to people here. We also spoke about the, um, the state's energy plan, which is, I think, very interesting and has a lot of potential. Uh, I will say that from what I gather, the permitting process for renewable energy projects needs to be streamlined. Um, we at the League would like to see it happen like that so that we could delay one project and expedite another. We live in a community that has uh, a lot of water and a lot of wind. And so I'm wondering with respect to the update of our current plan, uh, whether or not it's being considered, whether energy has been raised as a matter. I'm sure that it's been anticipated because you've anticipated everything. But I'm just wondering what role it might have and if it doesn't have a role, um, I'm, I'm asking now whether or not it could be please taken into consideration. It has been considered for Long Island Sound. Um, and just so that you know, the Broadwater decision was the last big decision I got to direct before I retired. And that set the tone and pretty much gave the states 
position with regard to energy facilities in Long Island Sound. Um, Long Island Sound is not the place for them. Mm -hmm. uh, there, was only, there were only three facilities envisioned in Long Island Sound for energy, and even those were temporary, and they were essentially the existing offshore loading platforms that exist on the Long Island side. Um, one of them was to be moved from a sensitive inshore area further offshore where there was less risk to, of an accident and fewer conflicts with uses, but over time that would be phased out. Um, that policy, if you will, of, of not to industrialize Long Island Sound um, also applies to some degree in the Atlantic Ocean until you get outside the territorial limits of the state. Um, and I mentioned earlier on what a water dependent use is. Um, a wind energy, a wind, wind energy, or a wind energy generating facility is not water dependent. It doesn't belong in the coastal area on the water. It can function on land or if you take it outside of the territorial limits of the states and or the United States, and I'm not making this a NIMBY type, into a NIMBY type concept here. Um, Think of the nearshore area, which, which, and when I use the term nearshore here, I mean within a few miles of the shoreline. I said before it's the most physically dynamic, the most biologically productive, the most populated, and overall the most sensitive part of the world. We have more conflicts than you could write down in a year of trying to list them in that area. The best way to deal with reserving important space for important water dependent uses and protecting sensitive natural resources and protecting and avoiding conflicts between uses is to move these things further offshore where we don't have the conflicts, where the resources are not as sensitive and won't be as significantly impaired. Um, Long Island Sound doesn't meet those sorts of criteria. It's just, it's too busy. Um, and it's too impaired. Um, just so you know, you, you said before that I spent the first part of my career in the field. I lived on the bottom of Long Island Sound for five years in an undersea laboratory. Um, a good friend of mine who used to be the dean of uh, the Marine Sciences Research Center at SUNY Stony Brook used to get up and say that the water quality or the, or the quality of Long Island Sound has improved tremendously in the past few decades. And I agree that it has, but only from a human health perspective. As an ecosystem, Long Island Sound is continuing to crash. And as researchers, we don't even know what kinds of questions to ask to understand what kind of research needs to be done to get a better handle on understanding why it's continuing to crash. We are so far behind. Um, from a little perspective there, Long Island Sound needs a lot more done to it to improve on the land side and on the water side. New industrial energy facilities, whether they're clean energy derived from wind um, or solar powered just won't work in the water in the sound. Um, and that reflects state policy. Um, many state policies, not just natural resource protection policies, but also those pertaining to water dependent uses and avoiding conflicts among them. Thank you. Are there any, uh, do we have any questions or any statements from people in the audience because this is for you? Uh, there's a microphone here if anybody would like to come and say any few words or ask a question. Yeah, I'd like to, is this on? Uh, I'd like to ask Adam a question uh, based on um, your very uh, fascinating slides of uh, the village uh, and your history with um, uh, the work that you're doing. If you would say, if you could give us uh, three or four main things when you have all this information, what you think should be done with it in terms of an LWRP revision? Um, and what are the biggest pit pitfalls that we fall into by not doing it? That's a good question. Uh, I am not entirely fully fluid with uh, the particular process that my, my colleague <laughs> here is. I would say that it's it's like a, it's like any other piece of information. You know, we, we we saw some information that is being built in there, the wetlands, the floodplains. Uh, but I think this is the kind of information that well, it, it depends on the community and the community's willingness and how far they want to look in the future. I, I heard this is a 50-year plan, so I would I would assume that 
this kind of look in the future would be something that would be of value and of interest uh, and, and would complement some of the other data layers. In terms of pitfalls, I guess the question would be, what? so you've built in floodplains, which we know do not incorporate sea level rise. What's, what's, what's the, what are the costs associated with not building this kind of information in? Um, if, if it's readily available and is coming from a credible place, why wouldn't you want to look into the future and build this information if it's available? There may be other confounding or uh, other types of considerations that are at play in a particular community that would, would, would uh, negate the use of this kind of information. But uh, I don't know, I'd be interested in what, what your comments are on that and, yeah. and related to this particular process. Uh, for me, as I, <coughs> we had, um, I mentioned to Paul Ryan as Adam was presenting the slides that I deliberately did not bring aboard uh, on the Hurricane 3 uh, sort of analysis of the village of Mamaroneck. Uh, I will show it to the committee uh, tomorrow night because it, it um, you know, as Adam said, it's their various projections. But I will give you one example. Uh, that's not Mamaroneck based, but I would say a most important thing is to not propose projects, uh, either in, in an LWRP or a comprehensive plan, where you have this data. And I'm going to give you an example of one that may sound a little bit outlandish to you, but it's in another jurisdiction that I'm very familiar with, so I'll use it. We have all these hurricane, you know, level three maps uh, from Columbia from the Goddard Space Center, Plan NYC has them. And you can see them for all of Jamaica Bay. There happens to be a very big resource near Jamaica Bay, and it's called John F. Kennedy Airport. And I was astounded, astounded, two months ago, and then last month at the Regional Plan Association Conference to hear an organization as tremendous as RPA is, and thoughtful as they are, and I'm a member and I'm a supporter, and the Port Authority of New York suggest in an official plan that they must, in terms of expanding New York City's airports, expand two runways at JFK, and in order to do one, we'll have to fill in a part of Jamaica Bay, a national, national resource, recreation resource, which would require an act of Congress. In addition to that, if you look and overlay those hurricane maps, the whole thing is affected by the maps that Adam shows. So we have two, one, one great not-for-profit group and a tremendous agency, the Port of New York Authority and New Jersey Authority, proposing a plan that directly contravenes all of this information. So they're looking 50 years into the future but so is this information. It's building up to a real conflict. And the cost benefit of that, I think, is something is beyond, you know, uh, one economist in our firm is looking at that, Regina Armstrong. She was the economist for RPA at one time and is now the economist for NIMTEC. Um, this is going to set up something at a regional level that's very, very important to resolve. But at a Mamaroneck level, I would say something as small as Hampshire Country Club. It was sold last year. Um, we have it zoned for R20. The town has it zoned for R30. Do we ever want to see that type of development in a critical environmental area, all of which is in a floodplain and a Hurricane 3 map? Maybe we plan ahead for that a little bit more, a la Bonnie Breyer, or uh, m maybe try to mitigate that in the future. I'm not saying there's anything there that is proposed. There isn't. But um, we're, we're, we should look at our, 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 our zones in the village in terms of these Category 3 uh, hurricane maps. I mean, even if it's just from a human health and safety or emergency management perspective, it, it's, it's, uh, it seems like it would be relevant. You mentioned a zone, a 20 and a 30, and, and that suggests to me um, that maybe there are conflicts uh, uh, that, that can be very confusing to people in a community uh, so that 
is one of the goals when you update this plan to streamline whatever the other uh, approval processes may be so that if somebody wants to do something that if it's a personal change for example maybe I'll throw out putting a dock in I know that's probably opening up a whole door but uh, if I want to put a dock in because maybe that's something that somebody wants to do here um, who do they go to what impact does the LWRP have is it consistent with local zoning or coastal zone or, or what have you uh, well, at the Mamaronic level and also Portchester level, the LWRP does address that and, and the docks. And one of the things the, uh, the harbor master uh, is looking at in, in the village is the process of doing that, what process people go through. Uh, but we do want to continue to control some of that, and, and particularly in light of you know, what Adam's just uh, shown. But in terms of... Uh, uh, development approvals process. We, we have been discussing with the committee um, whether there might be uh, a process that might make it a little clearer for uh, 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 people going through the process. We, we have a, um, by the way, we, I grew up in Connecticut also, and we practice a lot in Connecticut, and it's just a much simpler state. <laughs> you have the town and you have the state. And here we have a lot of other jurisdictions. Uh, and it makes New York extremely complicated. But even within our New York system, uh, we can bounce around uh, a homeowner, for instance, between the Zoning Board of Appeals on a special permit uh, and you know, the Planning Board on a site plan, and then our local uh, you know, waterfront, uh, what we call a harbor and, and uh, uh, coastal committee. Um, so you need for consistency. So you need a lot of different, uh, you know, you're between a lot of different boards. And it's something that the trustees have been looking at, our waterfront committee is looking at. Um, but it's a process that's very protective. And I think uh, there are many who are comfortable with it. Uh, but some applicants do get, it, it can be lengthy. And, and we're, we're looking at various ways, just discussions with the committee as to whether that could be um, perhaps uh, streamlined a little without, uh, without being less protective of, of the coastline. Um, yes, Terry, please. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for, for being here tonight and Beth for, for organizing it. Uh, I got a couple of comments and then a, a question especially for Adam. Um, in support of what Steve Ressler said before about the authority of the Department of State over federal projects. The Army Corps, as most of us know, is working on a project, you know, design project research for the Mamaroneck Sheldrake Rivers. Mm -hmm. At the last Army Corps meeting, I spoke with one of their representatives and I said, do you realize that you have to take whatever plans you have to the Departments of State for a coastal consistency? Mm -hmm. And have you done so yet? And he said, we have been in touch. Uh, they have said that it's a little bit premature, but they realize that they have to go through this process too. So there is quite a bit of power involved with the Department of State and NOAA and everything else, which is you know, to our advantage in the long run. Um, one thing that really hasn't been discussed too much, and I, I got involved in it, and I think Steve was involved at the time, with the L.R. Johnson report on the underwater land study back in the late 1980s. And it went into a description of the public trust doctrine. And Steve probably knows it a heck of a lot better than I do. Maybe he can explain it, but it goes back to Roman times uh, about the right of the people to access of water and fresh water and, and all that kind of thing. So it, it's it's, you know, we talk about local laws and federal laws, but this is based on stuff that goes back in common law, back to Justinian or whoever in whatever BC or whatever it was. So, I mean, it, it, it goes back and it, it's a matter of philosophy, which has, has hopefully promulgated the laws of the past. Um, you know, going with the underwater land, I, I've got to go back to Adam. And of course, you know, the underwater lands are a part of the history of New York State and land grants from the, the Dutch 
down through the English and now managed by the Office of General Services. And the, again, you know, the state is the, the keeper of underwater lands, I guess, below mean high tide and all that. So I'm curious as to what the rise in sea level will do to property rights of people that now have land that's above water. Uh, my second question for you, Adam, is you're, you've got the, um, the maps and tables mm -hmm. on, you know, on flooding and you know, the damage that will be done. The village of Mamaronek is, is rather unique because we have the riverine flooding, uh, which is probably more serious than coastal flooding, at least now. Is the, the coastal rise in level based on um, uh, uh, melting of the polar ice caps, is that going to cause a change in weather and precipitation which will aggravate what we've already got as far as riverine flooding? Thank you. <laughs> huge, huge big questions. Uh, you know, the, the idea of uh, when a state does adjust that, that the high mean water line or uh, depending on what, whether you're a low or a high state, that essentially, correct me if I'm wrong, is a transfer to state ownership. So, you know, you could have this, and, and you know, I, my, what comes to mind is every 19 years or so, uh, adjustments in, in that, that, that state Ownership line. I, Steve, what are your thoughts on um, that? That's, uh, that's a very provocative question. And I've had to testify about it in courtrooms. Um, it depends on what we call fixed or ambulatory property lines. Um, the state, in accordance with state law, public lands law, um, claims ownership of all underwater and formerly underwater lands to the last known location of mean high water, except where there's been a colonial grant of those lands, usually to a municipality, sometimes individuals, mm -hmm. but that's rare. Um, that's just about the only exception. Um, so the presumption is when you first start out that anything seaward of the mean high water line is the property of the state or on Long Island of a Long Island town, which right. Right. predates statehood. Um, and we just won't go very far with that. With regard to property lines and erosion or accretion of the shoreline or rises in tidal elevations and whatnot, it depends on whether the upland owner has a fixed or ambulatory property line. If at some point in time all four sides of a piece of property or six sides of a strange shape uh, are fixed by meets and bounds, meaning minutes, both distances, minutes, degrees, and seconds, that's fixed forever. It does not change. So if you own a piece of property that's defined as going to the water's edge, and there's a specific side yard distance and direction for that, and then a specific fixed line at what was once the mean high water line, mm -hmm. then you always retain ownership of that amount of space, no matter whether the shoreline changes, accretes or erodes. You still own that fixed amount of land, so that if the upland erodes, you now own both upland and underwater lands. If the shoreline accretes, you no longer have waterfront property. And there's a whole nother can of worms open up that opens up to that. If you have ambulatory property lines, for example, you have a fixed line along the street, and then the lines project not a fixed distance, but in minutes, degrees, second in a direction to the, to the water's edge, to mean high water, thence along mean high water to another point, and then landward again, you have an ambulatory line. So as the shoreline erodes, you lose property, and as it accretes, you gain. That's what determines what, at least at this point in time, what is happening now as the shoreline moves and as sea level rises. I can't tell you whether that's going to change in the future. I don't imagine it's going to change anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, so we find today that people have seawalls, for example. Um, Dan's familiar with this because as a consultant who, who applies for permits to repair them. Um, Seawalls that are off the upland known as property and sometimes 25 or 30 feet seaward of their property line on public land. And we have many times said, sorry, you cannot rebuild there, move it back. And by the way, you're in an erosion hazard area, don't just put it on your property line, move it landward, even further, out of the hazard area so that you don't now reduce 
public access to and use of the shoreline. You allow for continued advancement of wetlands over time. You allow for that area to absorb floodwaters. That's the way it works. That's the way it's supposed to be done. Um, and, if you're, and, if your house, and if your house happens to be in that erosion That's hazard the area, um, the policy of the state of New York, reflected in law, not always implemented properly, is you are required to use non-structural measures to address a hazard. You are required to do it. It's not if, it's not if it's, you know, too expensive to do otherwise. You must use what we call a non-structural measure, which means you do not build seawalls um, or anything else like that. And, and you don't even put sand on the beach because even that's a structural measure um, unless there is absolutely no other option available. In most instances, there is sufficient room on the upland to move a residence landward away from a hazard area, away from a wetland and an erosion hazard area like a beach or a dune. And by the way, a wetland is what we call a natural protective feature in New York, which offers all the benefits mm -hmm. of flood protection and whatnot, as well as the biological benefits of them. So you must move away from the hazard first. Uh, that includes, if you have to, let's say you have a 4,000 square foot home on a barrier beach. You're in a hazard area. Um, it's been damaged to some degree by a storm. You should not be rebuilding in the same place again. You should be moving landward, either completely out of the hazard area or as far from it as you can get. And if that puts you right in your uh, front yard setback next to a walkway or a street, then that's where you're going to have to go and you ask for a variance from that front yard setback to put the house there. If you can't fit a 4,000 square foot home in that piece of land that remains outside of the hazard area, then you don't get a 4,000 square foot home. You may only get a 1,200 1, square foot home, narrow and tall rather than spread out over a large area. That's what is required in New York now and that achieves many multiple benefits. Wetlands protection, flood and storm surge protection, um, appropriate development in appropriate areas. That's, that's the way it's supposed to be done. And you retain public access to and along the publicly owned shoreline, which you won't do if you build a seawall there, which results in the erosion, either the erosion of the beach in front of it or as sea level rises, sea level is coincident with the wall, the public no longer has a place to access and use their own property. So you achieve multiple objectives by moving away from the hazard and that is what's required except, except where there is no other option available. And there are places like that in some of the areas in the Maranek Village, in the city of New York, in our major cities, there's no place to go. So we have to use structural measures. We flood proof, we raise, we have no other option. Mm -hmm. But in those other areas, the policy is to move out and that's why we need comprehensive plans to provide the means of foreseeing that and providing the way to do that that society can withstand economically and otherwise. Terry, thank you. Do you need that adjusted or are you, you got that? My comments may seem very juvenile compared to, to the esoteric discussion we've had, which has been very informative and very, and made me realize how much studying I have to do. But let me just say that the previous questioner brought up the issue that I wanted to bring up the, the, the river watershed and what it will do to all of us. It begins in White Plains for one place, and it, it will affect the coast, there's no question in my mind. We've come a long way from when I first moved to the town of Mamaroneck, which we didn't include in the discussion very much, and I would take my children to Harbor Island to swim, and after a few years we had to stop because the, the boats would deposit oil, and it took a few years for the, t for the village to say, you can't do that anymore. I had to stop using Harbor Island. So we can move along and improve, but I do think that the question of the watershed is very important because that's going to impact the coastal areas. And I think you have to include the town of Mamaroneck and the village of Larchmont in your considerations. Thank you. By the way, that is um, one thing we've been discussing in the village, that the, the whole village watershed goes up, as you rightly said, into White Plains, where, where the village does not have jurisdiction. But the county does. So the county is looking at this whole watershed issue and the villages participating in that with them, as well as the Corps of Engineers. The Corps is looking at how do we solve this riverine 
or of rain rather, flooding uh, issue. It's an issue now. I mean, we had, tr as you know, tremendous flooding uh, in the village a number of years ago. And so we have that issue now, it's present now, and that is a, is a big issue before the village. But they are working with the county who has a wider uh, jurisdiction on it. I think uh, Steve wanted to mention something about Bonnie Breyer. Um, for those of you that don't know, Bonnie, Br Bonner Breyer, we call it the Bonnie Breyer syndicate decision, um, which was a court decision as a result of a decision by the town of Ameranek to rezone the golf courses in the municipality um, so that they could not be developed in the future for residential or other uses, uh, but instead be reserved or preserved for flood control, to protect water quality, to retain some of the last or remaining open space, large open spaces in the municipality for public access and public recreation long into the future. Um, so residential and other types of development are expressly prohibited in that area and instead it's to be reserved and preserved for those specific purposes. And that case uh, made its way to the New York State Court of Appeals and which for those of you who don't know, is really the highest court of the state of New York um, and upheld that rezoning when it was challenged by the owners. Um, it was a very good decision, but again, it was, it was based on comprehensive planning by the municipality years ago, subsequently reflected in their elder RP, and the court in its decisions referred to that um, as providing a rational basis for that kind of decision making, um, which will serve the municipality well many decades into the future. And there's many, there's several people here, <laughs> including Paul Ryan, who were involved in, in the Bonnie Breyer uh, decision. It was an uh, absolute astounding de decision for all of us. I happen to have represented not the syndicate, but the golfers, with the former mayor of Mamaroneck, Bob Funicello, who was their lawyer. Uh, we all thought, at the time, we wanted to preserve the golf course, but we had never heard of I had not heard of in planning, and Bob had not heard of legally, that you could actually zone property for recreation for no development purposes other than what was there. It was very similar in land use decision, zoning decision, to the Grand Central decision, landmarking Grand Central Station, uh, and the Supreme Court said, as long as it can be used for the use for which it was designed and is being used, that is not a taking of private property without just compensation. What we were worried about in Bonnie Breyer was the Constitution of the United States. And Bonnie Breyer went to the highest court of this state and was then denied certiorari. The Supreme Court decided not to take the case up. Because. So this has not been adjudicated at the Supreme Court, but in terms of this state, we have the ability to zone for the use for which something is used, the recreational use, if we have substantial environmental uh, basis uh, for doing that, a substantial basis for doing that. If, if anyone knows who Lee Koppelman is, Lee Koppelman was, was Long Island's, Eastern Long Island's version of Robert Moses. Um, he's still around, but Lee once challenged me when we suggested that kind of zoning for property. And at one point, we recommended zoning an area that was a golf course for a golf course. And Lee said, are you out of your mind? There is no economically viable return there. And I said, are you telling me that Pebble Beach isn't economically viable? The Pebble Beach Golf Club? It certainly is. And we've subsequently developed zoning um, for estuarine areas. And the category is estuarine one, estuarine two, estuarine three providing for only those uses that are viable in a water body. Um, estuarine one, where you are only allowed to provide uses that support um, or protect natural resource values. Estuarine two, supporting recreational uses that in areas that are somewhat impaired um, from a natural resource perspective where those uses will not further impair them. And estuarine three, where you can provide for more intense use of in-water spaces um, and the adjacent upland, privately owned areas um, where there are no sensitive resources at all. Um, but you can do anything. You can zone an island and call it an island category and limit the uses on those areas provided, provided you're, you're advancing some legitimate 
governmental objective and you're doing it in the proper manner. You can zone anything almost any way you want to achieve those objectives. And that's important. We'll have one more question and I think we'll end and if there are any follow-up questions, we'll take them. Dan, did you want to? Again, I'm sorry. My name is Dan Natchez, um, and I have a couple of comments and, and a couple of questions, and I'll try to make it very quickly. Um, the first is, based on this discussion that we've just had regarding Bonn and Briar and Hampshire Country Club, the current draft of the LWRP says is basically punting and saying that uh, we're not doing anything about it because it's in a pending draft comprehensive plan that was proposed in 2008 hasn't seen the light of, hasn't been presented to the public and sort of sitting there. My suggestion is, uh, and a uh, very, uh, I think based on this discussion tonight, very significant that if you are going through the LWRP revision and th there are uh, five to seven properties that are recreationally oriented, uh, not as large as Hampshire, uh, all of which should be taken under consideration for retaining that type of access, and I would like to use the word or the term access by the public as opposed to public access, uh, because one implies unrestricted access and one, and I don't know of any park in the United States that it has unrestricted access these days. So th there are controls that you have to put on, you know, onto access to make it reasonable. But I would think that the, uh, the a comprehensive plan uh, or a comprehensive revision of the LWRP would definitely include a policy as to what should or should not be done with parcels such as uh, in uh, the uh, not only Hampshire but some of the other parcels as well. Uh, just simply saying it's going to be part of something else I think is punting and actually not coming to grips with what part of the charges uh, uh, that has been created for the um, rezoning of the LWRP. So I strongly recommend that. Um, I also like to follow up uh, in terms of, I'm delighted we're having a couple of public workshops, but as one who was intimately involved uh, in my youth <laughs> uh, with the original LWRP, because I only admit to being 25, uh, <laughs> uh, the, one of the issues was uh, including the entire public in the process of creating the LWRP. While you had a working committee of, uh, I think, five or seven people, back then, what you actually had was a working committee of 33 citizens. Anybody who wanted to come, anybody who wanted to be part of not just commenting, but part of the entire process of creating, drafting, commenting, um, was, was not only allowed, but it was encouraged. And, as, and what we ended up with in terms of the LWRP was something that is, I think, served the village exceedingly well over the past 20 years. Where you go for the next 50 years, um, you know, and actually I learned a great deal from listening to Adam. Uh, I had not expected to have so much insight from that. Uh, but it points up several things. Uh, in the maps that uh, you were kind enough to show, uh, um, Frank, in uh, your presentation, uh, which actually showed the FEMA boundaries, I assume, for the floodplains, um, we just had a, a flood, you know, a couple of years ago that far exceeded, you know, the, what is billed as the 200-year storm, and we didn't have a 200-year storm. Um, uh, we've had, in my lifetime, three major storms where uh, I can remember as a kid launching a uh, Boston whaler uh, just south of the, uh, I'm sorry, just north of uh, the uh, movie theater and going all the way down Romantic Avenue to the th what is now the thruway, uh, rescuing people from houses. Uh, it seems to me that we should be looking at a more comprehensive plan in terms of what are the effects, you know, that we know that can be documented. We don't have to go back, you know, 20 years. We don't have to go back 10 years. We don't we only have to go back four years. And you have, you know, empirical evidence, uh, including the closing off of the Boston Post Road by the overflowing of uh, two of the rivers uh, where you, couldn't, you could not pass for several hours. These are the types of things that, you know, when you talk about what you do and where you go in the LWRP should be in the forefront, not in the background. And lastly, but not, um, uh, not minorly, if I may, uh, and I have a whole list of things, but which I'll 
be happy to share on the 11th with you or if not before. But one of the biggest things that I find the biggest problem with government efforts, and I don't say this belittlingly, I just simply say, think we all fall into this trap of we got to document everything and we have this very thick document uh, like you're sitting on the desk and say, here's the plan. Well, nobody really can read that. And nobody can enforce it. And when you talk about then land use boards that have to deal with it, it needs to be succinct and it needs to be specific and it needs to be easy. And if anything, the draft that is now out there is anything but that. It is, you know, on your, uh, on your proposed policies today, you have 49 pages, uh, including your maps and whatever, for 13 policies. We have 44 policies in the original one and 44 pages. Something is wrong. And there is nobody, uh, with all due respect, uh, no matter how, how knowledgeable we are or how, um, uh, how well-meaning we are, can really digest this and understand it. And the last big aspect that I find the biggest problem with the draft to date uh, is it is not an interactive review of what needs to be done. We, three times tonight there's been reference to the zoning, yet in the, uh, that, uh, in, in the discussion of the LWRP policies, and then in the two sections of what to do in the terms of one is projects and one is laws, which are, you can't take one without the other because they're totally integrated and you got to flip from one chapter to the other chapter and back and forth, you know, to truly try and understand what the implications are. They're not integrated. And one of the problems that we have is every time there's an issue, government passes a law. You know, how many times have we said there should be a law about this? So we now have a flood development law. We now have a wetlands law. We now have a stormwater law. We now have an LWRP. We have a zoning law. Those five things, and I, actually there are nine, if you go through them in the village, of major laws, were all developed separately, independently, and without any, any real review of the cause and effect relationship. So if we are really doing our service in terms of the next 50 years in the vision of the LWRP, what we need to do is not only f be succinct in what the policies are of the 13 policies that we are now going to be, you know, uh, putting forth as the reduction of the 44 policies, bring it back into simplistic language that is clear, concise, and meaningful, uh, and then take that in turn and integrate that into how do the other laws have to be revised so that you have a real cause and effect and meaningful relationship. Otherwise, we're kidding ourselves. And all you do is set it, set it up. And one last comment, I'm sorry, I know I'm out of time and I apologize for bearing with me. But Frank, in your statement was, you know, we preserved the working waterfront. The LWRP did preserve the work, working waterfront. But that working waterfront today is under major pressure and is what I would call an endangered species far greater than any other nat natural mm -hmm. endangered species that we have. And it's not going to take much to push them out. And what is not addressed, uh, uh, and what is n there is no focus on what to do to really preserve the working waterfront for the next 50 years. And without that, you do not have what we ha what was referred to when you read that you know eloquent statement from 18 what was it? 1830. 1830. Mm -hmm. You don't have that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the type of thing that we need to do. And I want to thank you all for coming and sharing your thoughts because I, f I found this exceedingly helpful and very meaningful. Thank you very much. There uh, is an opportunity for anyone at home who watches this tonight. Uh, I, w I want to mention that when we first planned this evening, uh, the village trustees did not have a board meeting but it was rescheduled for tonight and for that reason Mayor Rosenblum couldn't be here. I know the deputy mayor is here and I'm glad that you are here but I'm sorry assistant the assistant village, village manager um, and, but we hope that the board of trustees and the mayor will have an opportunity to watch this um, again because LMC TV is available both on demand and I think there'll be specific times to watch it. Um, I'm very proud of myself for putting this together because I think that this is, I gotta say, this is, uh, this is 
an amazing collection of uh, information for this community where we've got the history of this plan of the statutes from the federal to the state to the local government and all of the complicated interworkings and we've got the gentleman who is now involved in updating it and we've got all the brains that are looking at what we're doing for the future and now it's up to us as a community to come forward and be involved in this process. We owe it to ourselves, we owe it to the Long Island Sound, we owe it to our children. So we've done our part tonight. We're very, very pleased to be here. We're now inviting the public, please, to be involved. Please leave your um, email address, and if there's anyone at home, again, I'm going to say that would like to be notified, you can contact LMC TV. I'm sure that Eric Lewis or, or Jessica or Dina can get the information to me. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you for doing that.